All right, very good. Welcome, everyone. It's nice to have you back for our Mastering Hard Conversations for Business Owners series. We had we have four programs in this particular series. Last week, we had Earl Gregorich from the, South, uh, the Small Business Development Center talk about hard conversations with uh, lenders and investors. And we are very pleased to have Larry Block here today with SCORE or the Service Corps of Retired Executives talking about how to talk sale, about sales conversations with potential customers. In two weeks, we will have Anna Para speak about um, difficult conversations with the networking, how to make sure that your pitch is, your, and it's not necessarily a pitch, how you, know, you talk clearly about what you do in a business and it doesn't get uncomfortable. And then two weeks from then, which will be October 21st, I believe, um, I will be talking about hard conversations related to problems, how to talk about problems uh, with your business partners, your spouses, um, your employees, and we'll have a panel discussion for that. But today, I am very pleased to turn it over to um, Larry Block with, with SCORE. Uh, Fred Robb is here as well. He will be facilitating the questions. So if you do have questions, please put them into the chat. And then Fred will read them out to um, to Larry. So we look forward to hearing from y'all today. And thank you so much. And I'm going to put myself on mute. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Larry Block with SCORE. Um, I've had an interesting career. I've had about half of my career in the corporate world. Actually, I started out as a social worker, and then I was the youngest parole officer in the state of Ohio. And then I finally got into the business world. I had about half my career in the corporate world, ending up as an international vice president um, for Xerox Corporation, traveling all over the world, lots of fun, running about a 500 person sales force. And then I eventually went to work for my wife who owned an ad agency and I spent the last part of my career till I retired working for her. We did a lot of public relations work. Um, the, the topic today uh, is one I'm very familiar with because when I was with Xerox in particular, I had to train people all over the world and um, we couldn't bring them into, my division was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we couldn't bring them to America. So I learned to train the, tra I went through the train the trainer program. So I did sales training in the Xerox method, which is a consultative selling method, which I'll be talking about some uh, as we go along um, and did it all over the world. So when I, even when I worked in my wife's ad agency, I did a lot of sales training on our clients. So a lot of the things we're gonna talk about today um, are, are relative to, to sales and doing presentations. Um, here's the agenda and we're gonna talk, the first four things on here, we're gonna go through fairly quickly and then work harder on standing up, how you do stand up and uh, how you engage your audience. So we're gonna talk about what you're planning to present. Then we're gonna talk about selecting the key elements for your presentation, creating an outline of what you'll present, and talk a bit about the visual software, which some of you probably know a lot better because you're younger than me um, than I do. And then working on stand-up skills, we'll concentrate a lot more there, and especially on engaging your audience. So what are you going to present? First thing you need to do when you're starting to plan to, to uh, do a presentation whether it's a one-on-one -on -one or it's to a group, um, is is to think about what you're going to present and try to try to start by laying that out in your mind. What's the goal of your presentation? You'd be amazed how many people go in to do a presentation and don't really have a clear goal about what they hope to come out with. You need to concentrate on straightforward content. A lot of people get lost in the weeds. You know the old KISS, keep it simple, stupid. You want to keep it as simple as you can. You want to re remove extraneous information. A lot of people, and I'll mention this later, fall in love with certain parts of what they have to talk to people about and, and get pretty much into too much detail about it, either ever or before it, it's relevant and makes, makes sense to do it. So you need to focus on what matters and you need to think about the visual part of your presentation from the start. If you're doing something that has visuals involved, um, what you're going to show 
and by the way, I'm not necessarily in favor of always having visuals. It depends on what kind of a situation you're in. Some people will walk in to do a presentation just with it on a laptop. Some people will have to do one that is, if you had a large group, would be projecting it up on a screen. And in other cases, you don't really need to have anything to show at all. If you have something to show and you give it to people, chances are they will read it. So you never ever want to give your li your literature, so to speak, out before the end of your presentation or you will lose your audience. First, who are you going to be presenting to? And sometimes you have a lot of control over it, sometimes you don't. Who have you invited to your presentation? Right now I'm thinking in terms of, we're going to talk to a degree about group presentation to begin with and eventually we'll get down to one-on-one. To -on -one. Who have you invited to your presentation? Sometimes you have a lot of control over that, sometimes you don't. How did they get selected? Is it your choice or somebody else's? How many responsibility levels are you going to be talking to that are involved? And how can you target key parts of the audience? One of the great ways to do it, if you were a person who was making a sales presentation and first talked to one person at the company and they helped you set it up, you would, would be to try to create an, an ally relationship with that person so they'll give you some inside information and they'll help you select, they'll help you if you can direct them, select the right kind of people you want to have there. You may have different, different responsibility levels and you need to know kind of who you want to target in the audience. Sometimes you will find that there are people that are going to be in the audience because they need to be there or have to be there that you will be warned not to engage with. I've been in a situation where there's somebody who's just a kind of a troublemaker or somebody who's going to always be the devil's advocate or something like that. And I'm told by my ally in the company, don't, don't worry about him or her. They're, they're always doing stuff like that. Nobody really pays too much attention to them. Don't let them get you distracted. Now, you know, you're lucky if you can get that far into a relationship with someone in an organization before you do a presentation. Sometimes you won't be that lucky and you're, you're going to have to depend on your own in, intuitiveness to be able to, um, to, to figure out who you need to focus on and who you don't really need to worry about. So you want to lay out your presentation, um, and that's you know something I personally have quite a bit of difficulty with. I am um, ADD, I guess it's called, or ADS, Attention Deficit Syndrome. I have a very short attention span, and for me to lay out a presentation is a very painful thing. But it's something that you need to be able to do. A lot of people can do it quite a bit more easily than I can. But over my career, I've created I've written and directed 30 second spots, multi minute videos, and I did one 93 minute video for Hyatt Hotels worldwide where I had to plan out each shot. When you're shooting a video, for example, you don't shoot them in order. Usually you're shooting them so that they, that, that they work out so that if you had something at the beginning and something at the end in the same place, you would shoot the beginning and the end at the same time. So working out a shot, a shot list, for example, is extremely difficult. But you need to do that and you need to take the time to lay out how your presentation is going to work. Visualize the sections of its pages of your presentation. You need to do a preliminary out, outline of what each page will will uh, contain, and then you want to create a rough draft um, that that will give you a, a good look at how is it how it's going to go. Um, then you'll start fleshing out the actual words and stuff that you're going to put in. You'll put that detail you want, and visualization is always great if you can get people to visualize things throughout your presentation that's really great we'll talk about it again when we talk about a one-on-one -on -one. there's a number of visualization tricks if you want to call them or methods that can be used that will enable you to get people to visualize things when they visualize things you you're getting them to build rapport with you and, and that's the kind of thing that helps you uh, be successful in the presentation olha isso aqui carrega sempre separado tem gente colocar isso aqui no Okay. Larry, yeah. can I ask you a question? Sure. Any advice on how to establish some kind of a relationship with an ally in a presentation? Well, if you first come in and get to talk to one person and that person, for example, says, I like, I like what you've got. It sounds good. We, I can't make the decision by myself. Um, I'm going to need you to 
sometimes they'll say, I'll give me the information, I'll take it to my boss. You really want to avoid that. If you can possibly get them to agree to let you make a presentation to their boss or sometimes to a group, a group of people, then you could say to them, that's great, thanks for your thanks for letting me do it. I could use your help. By the way, always asking people for their help um, is a good thing because you'll be surprised, especially, I, I particularly like when dealing with gatekeepers, if you're making a call and it's so hard these days, it's been hard for a long time, but it's harder and harder to get through a gatekeeper. I always say, I need your help. That will surprise them a lot of times. Most people won't say that to them. Most people aren't nice to gatekeepers in the first place because they know they're going to be hard to get past. They believe their their you know their mission in life is to keep people from talking to their boss. Um, so if you say, I need your help, I'd like to talk to the person that's responsible for whatever it is. Um, and that that will will help you get there. So if you if you start to talk to this person, you want to you want to ask them if possible who who who's going to be invited to the meeting, and what does each person do, and who's who who is a person that's key key to this decision making and stuff like that. In a lot of cases, if you talk in a general gentle way with people, you'll you'll find a lot out. Okay. Um, presentation software. I won't focus here very long because. Like I say, I'm guessing most of you probably know how to use things like PowerPoint better than I do. Um, I, there's a number of them here. Uh, PowerPoint is probably the most popular. Um, if you have Word, if you have if you have the uh, the Office, uh, the Microsoft Office suite, you'll have PowerPoint, and it's reasonably easy to create stuff. I personally do it by doing it first in Word, turning it into um, PDFs and then put the PDFs into the PowerPoint. I have a feeling there may be a quicker and easier way. Open Office um, is also something that some people know about, some people don't. Open Office is a free sort of imitation and a good one of of uh, of, of PowerPoint or of of, the, of that whole Office suite. Um, it's it's from Oracle and you can get it for free. I have a son who's a computer consultant and for some reason he doesn't use the Office suite. He uses Open Office. Um, Google Slides is what we're in today, and it's also very easy to put together and use. And a couple others are Keynote and Zoho Show. All of them, I think, are, are free programs. But most people, I think, use, use PowerPoint or Google Slides, and they seem to work fine. When you're doing this, you want to create tight, relevant content that's just right for each page. Um, by the way, this, this slide presentation, as I said, is, is Google Slides. And I think it, it works pretty nicely, the, the photographs in there and stuff like that. They're all copyright cleared. That's an issue that a lot of people have. You don't want to use uh, copyrighted material without permission. And in a lot of cases, meaning you have to pay to use it. The pictures that were selected for this were all copyright, copyrighted, cleared, and, and available. So you want to protect, you want to plan tight, relevant content that's just right for each page. I hope to think that what we're doing here is using tight, relevant contact, uh, con content. Um, you want to create simple, easy to read words or phrases. You don't want to bury people with intellectual stuff. Um, you want to use a highly readable font. I love Arial um, and I use it in, in all kinds of stuff, but there are others that are very good as well. Um, you want to use spacing to present content in a visually pleasing way, and I think most of the way this, this uh, presentation lays out is a good example. And you want to uh, select and insert appropriate eye-catching graphics. And again, those graphics should be uh, copyright cleared, especially if you're doing some kind of big group presentation, people are going to see um, what, you're, what you're talking about. If you need to, you want to do more than one slide about the same particular subject rather than, than try to jam too much stuff onto one page. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about stand-up presentations, nightmares, and successes because early in my career I had one that was both. When I was 28 years old, I was working for Bell & Howell Corporation when Bell & Howell was still a big company that had lots of divisions. Now you probably know Bell & Howell only because they licensed the name on TV ads for flashlights and 
glasses that you can see in the dark with and stuff like that. Bell & Howe years ago until the late 80s was a big corporation with lots and lots of divisions. It was eventually purchased by um, investors and those investors broke the company up and sold the divisions. Anyway, I worked for a division that was in Ohio and we were called to Chicago where the headquarters were to go in front of the, the uh, chairman of the board, Peter G. Peterson, who went from being the chairman of the board of Bell & Howe to being the U.S. Secretary of Commerce and eventually was the chairman of Lehman Brothers and Wall Street. Um, he wanted to hear about products in existence and products being developed in the divisions and the divisions all came with usually with their president and their product guys. Well, my president was very savvy and he knew that the whole meeting was going to be a, a relative bloodbath. So he managed not to come at all. He sent me age 28 and a guy in his 50s to talk about our, our business. And we were supposed to go on at 10 in the morning. We didn't get on until three in the afternoon. It was one of those times that was really unpleasant. The room was filled with guys, some of whom I think were earning at least 10 times as much as I was. There were no women in the room. The only women that came in were very well-dressed secretaries who were bringing things in and out to their bosses and stuff like that. It was a pretty scary situation. For example, Peter Peterson asked the guys in charge of the printing division, how come your printers cost twice as much as Xerox and take twice as long to make prints? So uh, those were the kinds of questions that were being asked, pretty scary. Um, we finally got on at three in the afternoon and the guy I was with, a man in his 50s, went up and said, tried to be funny. He said, I've been with the company 20 years. That's why they gave me old business to talk about. By the way, Peter Peterson often didn't even look up from what he was reading and whole presentations would go by without him even making a comment if he didn't feel like it. And there was always noise, little buzzing going on in the room. It was very, very scary for a young guy like me. I was probably the youngest guy there. Anyway, my guy got up and said that he'd been with the company 20 years and um, and he uh, and that's why he was doing old business. And he did his, his little spiel for about 15 minutes. Peter Peterson never even looked up at him and he came back to his seat. Now it was my turn. I was very nervous, but somehow I said to myself, this guy's not gonna ignore me. I had notes, I left them at the table. I made my mind up, I was gonna just go up and do it without notes and I got up there and I started on my presentation and it was, we were a division of, of, of uh, Bell & Howe that produced things in microform research materials for college and university libraries. And I wanted to do a, a collection of underground newspapers. This was right near the end of the Vietnam War. And there were a bunch of newspapers produced basically by hippies like the East Village Other in New York and Berkeley Barb in California and uh, women's, women's underground papers like Ain't I a Woman and Off Our Backs. And I wanted to put these things on microfilm and sell them to colleges and universities. So I started to launch into my presentation and all of a sudden Peter Peterson looks up and holds up one finger. The whole room goes dead silent. He says in a rather disdainful way, who are you? And I took a moment, I said, I'm Larry Block. And I took a moment to get my thoughts together. And then I heard a voice, which I later realized was mine say, I've also been with the company 20 years. I joined when I was eight years old. Well, if you think the room was quiet before, the room was really quiet now. And I looked down and I saw the president of the group that my division was in turn gray in the face. Well, Peter Peterson laughed. And then of course the whole room laughed. And he said, tell me about this project. And I, I knew it very well. And I went through it and I told him why I thought it would be a great thing to do and that it would sell to lots, lots and lots of colleges and universities. And he said, can you get the American Library Association to endorse it? I said, absolutely. This is primary research material that they think should be in every library. He said, in that case, approved. And I went back to my seat feeling like a million bucks and after the meeting was over, he came to me, shook my hand, apologized for putting me on the spot and said he was putting together a group of about a dozen people from throughout the corporation to meet every Friday for three months to plan the long-term future of Bell and & Howell and wanted me on that panel. So it, it was, you know, it was, it was a high, one of the highlights of my life. I don't know what the moral of the story is. Maybe it is you gotta, you gotta trust your gut and uh, sometimes you got to take some chances 
and usually you're, you're, you'll, you'll turn out okay. So anyway, um, so let's talk about doing, doing a stand up in front of a group of people. We're, we're gonna concentrate on this for a little while and then we're going to uh, get into some more detail, uh, deeper detail about how, how to build rapport and stuff like that. Um, you want to open your presentation in a way that, get, that gains uh, the people's attention and, uh, and is going to have them right away have an interest in what you're saying. If you start out with something boring, it's gonna be hard to get away from that. Um, if there's a chance to do a meet and greet, that's a great opportunity um, for you to meet some of the people. And again, if you had an ally, that person will maybe introduce you around to pe people. Um, sometimes, of course, there's a situation where you're maybe feeding people. We do seminars here where we do all, all day seminars. We start out by giving people breakfast. That way we get a chance to talk, to, to talk around the room to the people that are gonna be in, in the presentation and stuff like that. Um, I would like you to notice that my shirt, if you can see it, has my badge and my badge is on the right side. Um, most people have, that have a shirt with a pocket, um, the pocket is on the left side in the easiest way. There you go, thank you, Fred. The, here's my, my badge. The easiest way when you get dressed to put on your name tag, if you're, if you're wearing a name tag, is to use that left hand button I mean, a left hand a pocket because once you're dressed, you can just stick it on there. It's usually with a, they're usually put on with magnets, um, and that and that way you're ready to go. The problem with that is when you shake hands with someone, you're not presenting your left side because you're reaching out with your right hand to shake their hand, and they're looking straight on at you. They're looking at your right side. So that's why I learned this many, many years ago. If you want to make the best use of your badge and have people really see your name and, and stuff like that, um, the thing to do is to take the time. I do it before I put my clothes on. Get that badge on your shirt uh, on, on the right-hand side. Just, just a, something to think about. Um, who to invite, we talked about it and we'll talk about it again. If you can get the right people in the room, that's great. Uh, and especially if you know who it is that's in the room that you need to focus on, you can kind of look at that person um, and, and that will help you get through to the person you need to get through. Um, what to wear, that's an interesting thing. Now, it used to be, it was pretty easy. Everybody wore suits and that was it, period. Everybody wore a suit and a tie. Uh, or, you know, a woman wore a woman's suit with a skirt and a, a nice blouse and stuff like that. These days, you never know. You're going to go somewhere, guys are going to be in jeans or, or they're going to be in suits. So, you, you, again, you want to try to find out what most people who are coming to your meeting are going to wear and, um, and dress accordingly. If you're going to go to a place where everybody's in jeans and T-shirts in a suit and tie, you're going to be out of place. If you're going to go to a place where everybody's in suits and ties and you're going to go in jeans and a t-shirt, again, you're, you're going to hurt yourself. So it's important to try to wear clothes that fit into the situation. And, that, and that's critical. People look at, at what people wear. People look at shoes and belts in the case of men. I'm sure in the case of women, people look at shoes for sure. But they look at what kind of shoes you're wearing. And sometimes they'll look at what kind of a belt you're wearing, what kind of a buckle it has and stuff like that. It's what I've learned. The podium is a great, a great tool. I love podiums. I like to lean on them. Uh, of course, I like to have my stuff on the podium that I, that I can look at and, and stuff like that. The podium is a real, can be really used as, a, as an appropriate crutch. Um, they can't see, you know, part of your body. They can't maybe see you fidgeting and stuff like that. So, and if you need to sort of gain control of your own feelings and situation, you can lean into that thing, grab it, hold on to it a little bit and stuff like that. I, for me, podiums are, are absolutely great. Another thing, of course, that's important, duh, though sometimes don't, people don't, is to know your subject. Um, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later on um, when we talk about portraiture of success. But um, it's critical to know, really know what you're going to talk about and have a good understanding of, of your product or service or whatever it is that you're, that you're offering to people. Part of how I did okay in that meeting with Pete Peterson was that 
I absolutely knew what I was was trying to do, why it would work. I thought about what 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 was in it for our customers because in the end, if you if you don't have something people will will buy, the old saying, if will the dogs eat it? Um, if you're making dog food, of course, uh, it's important that you really are understanding your subject and understanding in a way that it it is it comes across. So there's something in it for the people that you're talking to, or if you're talking like like if you were talking at a meeting in your company, why you want to do a certain project, why it'll work for for the customers. So knowing your subject is is quite critical. Um, you want to tailor your language and your details um, to your audience. There's been all kinds of studies done. Myers Briggs, I think, is the one that people know that's famous, and they have four different categories. I'm not going to get into them in any detail, and they have four different categories within the four different categories. So they end up with 16 sub categories. But their their basic groups are analysts, diplomats. Sentinels and explorers. Analysts are people like accountants and engineers. These are people that you can use more detail with because they're people who are very detail oriented. Diplomats, they're sort of middle manager people. They're people who try to make people work together and, and stuff like that. Sentinels, sentinels are often, often people that run companies, executives, people like that. And explorers, entrepreneurs are often, obviously almost have to be explorers and lots of sales type people are explorer people. So if you have a sense, again, if you have a sense of who's going to be there, then you'll you'll have a pretty good idea um, of how to tailor your language. If you're talking to a bunch of engineers, you better be ready to give them some really detailed stuff. If you're talking to people who are, who are you know, not engineering types, but are maybe middle management types, are buyers, um, people like that, they're not necessarily interested in a lot of detail. So you really need to tailor your language and details to your audience. If you get too deep into the weeds or too deep into detail, um, you're gonna lose your audience. Uh, jargon is also part of it. A lot of people will use various kinds of jargon that is familiar to them, but may not be familiar to people in their audience. So always they'll use, for example, they'll use initials for things. And, and some people don't know what those initials stand for. So they need to, you need to make sure that you think about what your audience level is, what their detail level of interest is, what they know about what you're maybe talking about, and, uh, and make sure that, that you're gauging that so that you're feeding them information that sounds, sounds good into their ears and, and makes, makes sense to them. Um, I've always asked people, how fast do you think people talk? And how many words per minute do, do you think people can absorb? Now, people in different parts of the country talk at different speeds. People in New York City talk about 100, on the average, 180 words a minute. People down in the South here talk more in the neighborhood of maybe 120 minutes. Maybe the people in the Midwest talk somewhere in between. But the interesting question is, how many words per minute does a person who's paying attention, is a person who's paying attention able to absorb? Obviously you're not, I can't let each of you tell me what you think, but if I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna guess some of you are gonna say 60 words or 80 words a minute. Fred, what do you think? 30. 300. People who are paying attention can absorb 300 words per minute. If they're paying attention, they will get the, the drift of what you're talking about and more than just in a casual way. So am I suggesting you talk as fast as you can? Absolutely not. I'm, in fact, I'm suggesting you talk at a speed that the people who are in your group are going to like. If a Southerner is talking to New Yorkers, New Yorkers are gonna go, oh, come on, man, get it out. If, if a New Yorker is talking to Southerners, Southerners are gonna say, why is this guy talking so fast? Doesn't he have any respect for me and stuff like that? So you need to kind of be able to, to balance your presentation. I'm a Northerner living in the South. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio originally. Um, I've lived in New York a couple of times, stuff like that, and I've lived all over the country really. Um, so I try to tailor my language and I say things like y'all and things like that to my Southern friends. In the end, you need to practice it in your own way. Some people like to do it in the mirror. 
that certainly is not my thing. Um, but And some people practice it on their friends, on their family. Um, I like to have, if you're a salesperson, for example, and you already have successes with certain clients and you put together a new sales pitch, which is one of the things I help our clients with, um, if you can practice your presentation on somebody who is already a customer of yours, a client of yours, someone that you have a, that kind of a relationship with and say, I'm, for example, I'm going to do a new presentation to a lot of people. Now, you, your company has bought what we have to sell. Would you mind my making the presentation to you to see what you think about it? And maybe you can give me some advice about what you think if I need to change some things or something like that. That's always a great thing if you can do it. Uh, obviously, that isn't always something you can you can have happen. It's the same goes for getting endorsements and things like that um, from people, which is another trick. By the way, if before we go on, if you ever want to get an endorsement, a written endorsement, here's what I suggest: ask the person who you want to do the endorsement what they think about what you have to offer makes them happy, and they'll tell you and say, I would love it if I could have a written endorsement from you. I know you're busy, so I know what you've said about what you like about what we do. If you don't mind, I will try to write down an endorsement that includes the things you've said. I will send it to you. You may throw it away, you may approve it, and you may edit it. Not a problem. Whatever you'd like to do, that is the, by far the best way to get to get an endorsement because people say, sure, I'll give you an endorsement and they never get around to writing it or something like that. The other thing is sometimes you'll want people to be able to vouch for you. Um, and you, again, don't ever want to send a potential customer to an existing customer without that customer knowing you're doing it. But again, you can say something like, this won't happen often but occasionally I'll have someone who is skeptical about our ability to offer what we say we would offer. Would you mind if I give your, your number to somebody once in, in a while to call you uh, to, to, to understand what we've done for you? If you do it that way, you'll be able to get people to do it. The same goes for a reference. I've given references to people all my life, um, but I don't like to have someone call me and say, I want a reference for so-and-so and not know that that person has given me as a reference. So those are some things to think about. Okay, we're gonna be getting now into a little more detail um, about building rapport and things like that. Um, why does building rapport help uh, any contact uh, pro process work better? Um, most people are comfortable with things they know and are used to. Um, only 10% or less people are likely to be the first to, like, for example, try something to buy something new. Um, those are adventurous kinds of people. Generally, most people want to want to buy or work with someone that make them comfortable because they know that those people have worked with people like them, peer people. Peer, peer, peer re relationships are very critical in building relationships with, with clients. I like to use visualization to create recognition. So I might say, in a, let's say in an introduction, I'm with such and such a company, we're located in South Carolina. Um, if, we're, if, if we're in, it, it, where we live here is the area around Greenville, I would say from our, from our offices in Greenville or from our offices in Simpsonville. If I can get a person to, um, if I'm talking to a person in Simpsonville, I might say from our offices here in Simpsonville. In each case, I'm trying to get the person to visualize where I am. I used to live in Naples, Florida, and I had clients in Michigan in the dead of winter. I'd say, I'm in Naples, Florida, and they would say, oh, I hate you. Well, they don't really hate you. They're picturing you being in a warm, comfortable place where it's, when it's cold where they are. They don't hold it against you. They visualize where you are, and that helps them to picture you and to get and to build build rapport with you. People love to use peer connections to create all kinds of comfort. Um, so I like to say things like people like you, organizations like yours companies like yours. 
This makes people recognize that you're doing something for other people like them that works, we hope, and so that so they can be be comfortable going ahead with maybe letting you do something you want to do with them. I like to say sometimes if it works like such and such a corporation, if it's if it's a, a company in their field that they respect, that you know is respected in that field, and you say that, they think, oh, well, they're already working for so-and-so. Now, if it's a competitor, maybe that's not the thing you want to say. But if it's a situation where they can identify with another company, or maybe not even in their field, like Michelin or something like that, if you're here, here in the Greenville area. Um, and you might, if you know it's a small enough industry and people know each other and there's a certain purple, a certain person in another company that they know and like, like Phil Rogers at X Corporation. You better have Phil Rogers know for sure that you mentioned his name because that's, you don't want to have somebody come up. You know that this sales guy just came in here and was talking about you. So you don't want that to happen, but you want to make sure that if you have an opportunity to use that, those are the kind of things that will absolutely establish rapport for you in a hurry and, and, and it will really work because then they'll really become comfortable. Those are all things, they'll visualize Phil Rogers. They'll visualize that you're, you have your office in Simpsonville. Um, so those are things to, to really keep in mind. And you want to sprinkle those kind of phrases throughout conversations. You want to always, you want to always Balance the way you throw things in. Calling a person by their name, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith. You don't want to do that too many times. Um, you, uh, you, you don't want to mention the name of their company too many times. You don't want to mention the name of your company too many times. We have clients in SCORE that have these brand new little companies. They have a name for the company. They want to keep saying it. It doesn't mean anything. I asked one guy if you're going to if you're going to have people search for your company online, what are the things they're going to search for? And he, the first thing he said was the name of his company. And I said nobody's going to search for the name of your company. They're going to search for what you what, what you have to offer. So that's something to think about. Um, another just another aside. I like to treat people with respect. I'll call people Mr. or Ms. Um, I will never ask permission to call someone by their first name. I don't mind that they call me by my first name. I always give my first and last name. People want to do business with their peers. So if you're Mr. Smith and I'm just Larry, I've already placed myself beneath you. So you're Mr. Smith and I'm Larry Block. And that keeps me on a peer level with you. Somebody may say to you, call me, by, call me, call me Jim or whatever. In that case, you can do it. There are rare occasions where you feel uncomfortable because that person is somebody maybe old, way older than you or someone in such a position that you just don't feel comfortable doing it. And you could even say, you could say it's, it's hard for me to call you by your first name, sir. Anyway, um, keep that kind of thing in mind. And I know as, as time has gone on, people have been more and more comfortable calling people by their first names. Just because someone calls you by your first name, doesn't necessarily mean you should call them by theirs. Just something, again, to keep in mind, if you have good sense about how to deal with people, those are the kind of things that, that will come pretty naturally, I hope. Okay, we're going to talk about gathering uh, information gathering. And here are two slides. As I said earlier, don't use one slide if, if you have too much information. So we're going to be using two slides. Um, I believe in the consultative approach. And I believe uh, that in addition, differently than the straight presentation, most people who sell are present presentation sellers. They tell people what they have and they, they hope that something they tell them they have will work. A consultative approach, which is something that was developed incidentally by Xerox in the early 1960s, is completely different. It's an approach where you ask questions and find out what people need and then you match the benefits of your of your of your product um, to 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 be able to get them interested in what you have. So you want to you want to ask questions properly and to show a potential customer that you're actually interested in what they need. And there are two kinds of questions to ask: open questions and closed. First, we'll talk about open questions. Open questions is a, the purpose of an open question is to get people talking. 
and a couple of good examples is tell me about or how do you go about doing such and such and then just shut up and let them talk. In some cases, they will say, well, this is how we do it. We buy our products from so-and-so, or we make these things, or we put these things together using some stuff that we have and some stuff that we buy. You'd be surprised how much you'd get in a lot of cases. In, a lot, in some cases, they won't, um, they won't give you the information. They'll just give you a, a few word answer. In that case, you don't want to use closed probes, which are going to, we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, you want to prompt them by by suggesting such a, such and such a thing like I can't think of a thing right now, but you know where do you get your printing done or how do you how do you print the, the forms you use in your company? And somebody may say, yeah, we print them ourselves, or something even less less clear than that. And you say, well, do you use outside printers or or something like that? Just just to get a, a general understanding of what what you're going to be talking to them about. Um, and the reason you're doing this is to just get a, an understanding of where to go from there and thank them, thank them for that information. Usually, I like to use just one open question. In some cases, you might use more than one. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, I like, I like to just use one where you get the person to talk and you listen very carefully to what they're saying so you have a little bit of a feel for where, you, where to go from there and thank them for the information because that's a signal that you're going to the next part of what you're going to ask. Well, let me ask you this, closed questions. Closed questions, the purpose is to confirm an interest or need and good examples would be, do you need, are you interested in, would, would such and such work for you, that kind of thing. Now, here comes the hard part for a lot of people and that's to be prepared to discard features and benefits that don't get a yes. Every salesperson I've ever known has some part of what they sell that they're in love with. It's because they've been successful with it, maybe it's because they understand it better or something like that, and they will try to push it on people. And that's a mistake. If that part of what they have to offer, and usually there are most, most products or most services, they have six, seven, eight different features and benefits. We're going to talk about features and benefits in a moment, by the way. Um, they have six or seven features and benefits that people will buy on. And most of the purchases are made on two to three. We say four, two to, two to four, not more. Um, if they buy from you for only one benefit that you have to offer, it better be mighty good. In some cases, just price. But um, you usually want to find two, three, four things that you offer out of the six, seven, eight that you have that people are interested in. And if they say yes to those, those are the ones that you're going to confirm and go, go ahead with. The ones that they don't show an interest in, whether you like them or not, forget about them because they're not going to help you make a sale to a person. So once you've gone through um, the part of the, of the presentation where you've asked some questions, um, you confirm what you learn. And you do it in a way that sounds like you're trying to make sure you understand what the person has told you. Let me see if I understand what you've told me today, Mr. Jones. The purpose actually is to make sure they understand what they've told you. Because if you ask the right questions, you may turn on some light bulbs in their heads that they haven't thought about in that, in that way. So when you say that you want to understand what, what they've told you, you are in fact reinforcing to them so that they understand. And if we were working through a complete sales presentation, which is one of the things we do here, we do an all day um, boot sales boot camp where people come in with only knowing the features of their products and leave with a complete sales pitch. Um, we reiterate over and over three or four times during the presentation um, to see if, if the people continue to understand and remember what they told us. So we say, let's see if I understand what you need, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Do I have a good understanding of what you need? And I always ask at the end, is there anything else? And they may tell you such and such, you know, it sounds like you do something great, but my brother-in-law supplies these things to us. And unless I want to stay married, I can't stop using him. So you might, that you know, those kinds of things actually do happen, by the way. Um, and that's a real good time to leave. It's not the time to try to sell against their brother-in-law. 
Um, so, so that's what you want to do. You want to confirm what you've learned before you go on and present features and benefits. Hey, Larry. Yep. I have a question from Aaron, and Aaron, jump in and unmute if you if you don't get the answer. The question is, how do you balance the consultative approach mm -hmm. within your presentation? How do you get that point across or those questions across? You start with a very short introduction, your name, the name of your company, and say in a very general way what your company does, and then say, may I ask you a few questions that will enable you and me to see if what my company has to offer will be of benefit to you. And that's all, that is an, that is an introduction. That's the introduction we teach people to use. Not any more than that. Don't give them something to hang a no on. Just give them just a, a very brief thing. Say your name, the name of your company, in the most general way, say what you do for companies like theirs. You know, I'm Larry Block with, with SCORE. We're based in Greenville, South Carolina. We help people like you um, who are starting businesses to get off on the right foot. May I ask you a few questions to see if what SCORE has to offer would be a benefit to you. So that's how you get, that's how you get into it. Um, we're gonna talk about features and benefits right now. And I will use a prop. Maybe lots of you know what this is. Not what you know what this is, obviously it's a water bottle. But I'm gonna give you the features of this water bottle. It has a screw on cap, it's made of clear plastic, it's round, and it has a flat bottom. So what? People don't buy features, people buy benefits. So what are the benefits? Screw on cap means you can take it off and on as many times as you want to. Clear plastic is one, it's non-porous so the water won't leak out. It's uh, clear so you can see how much you've got in it. Uh, it's round, I, maybe I didn't mention the feature round. Round means I can pick it up anywhere I want and a flat bottom means I can set it down on a surface. Those are benefits. And a lot of people try to sell features, doesn't work. And if they, if they sell the benefit associated with the features, and they find those, those things out by asking questions, would it be helpful for you to have a, a plastic bottle that has the name of your company on it? Um, would, would, uh, would something that uh, your customers could open and close as many times as they want be something that you would wanna have? Would you wanna have um, a, a bottle that enabled your customers to see how much liquid they had left. Would you want a bottle, obviously, with a flat bottom so it can sit on a table? So those, those are closed probes, okay? If you're trying to sell somebody a bottle, uh, sell somebody bottles, let's say it's a, a company that makes, makes some sort of liquid, you might start out and say, here would be your open probe. Tell me about how you, how you get bottles for your uh, products today. That would be the open probe and they'd say, well, we have several suppliers or whatever. And say, well, great, well, well, let me ask you this. Is it important to you to have bottles that are uh, environmentally uh, recyclable? They may say yes, they may say no. Um, would you need bottles that enable your, the, the contents to be safe for a long period of time so light wouldn't bother them? That, the, so those are the kinds of, of probes and you'd get a yes or a no and stuff like that. And by the time you were done, you would know which things they wanted to have in a bottle and which things they didn't care about. If they didn't care about the environmental stuff, you'd never bring it up again. If they didn't need a bottle that kept the, the liquids um, safe for years because the, uh, from ultraviolet light, you wouldn't bring it up again. So, so that's how you do it. So that's the difference between features and benefits. It's very important that people uh, recognize, that you recognize that people buy benefits they don't buy features. And, and the old what's in it for me, boy, I can't tell you enough. People don't think about when they're making presentations, they don't think about what's in it for the client. And that's absolutely critical. As long as they're thinking about and you can get across to them what's in it for them, then you're on your way to, to being a success, okay? So when I have people put a presentation together, I have them list the features, and then I have them match the benefits that encourage the audience to act, and I make sure that in the end we present the benefits. I like to use peer, peer uh, connections where appropriate, 
when presenting the benefits, people like X Corp said they need the same thing. That we, that's the way we usually introduce, introduce the benefits section of a sales pitch. After they've told you, I need this, 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 and this, I usually say, great, because clients just like you who are using us have told us, and you reiterate again what the person said, and then as you go into your benefits, and you say, for example, you said, and then you tell them what they said, and that's where you present the benefit. You need a bottle that, um, that will keep your liquid safe for years. And that's why we build bottles that include ultraviolet light protection, okay? Okay. Um, oh, I didn't go on here, did I? And I didn't, oh, I pushed the wrong button. Hello, Larry. Okay. Um, using summaries to test the product acceptance. This is really part of how people close sales. If you summarize what you've covered in your, in your presentation uh, correctly, you're gonna do very, very well. You're gonna remind people of everything they discussed one last time and do it in a clear way. And when I help people with sales pitches, they start out by being fairly verbose, still brief, but verbose about what somebody needs. Then the next time they say it, they're gonna say it a little more briefly. When they say it in the benefits section, they're even gonna say it a little more briefly. And when they come to the summary, which summary, which is part of the close, they will uh, say it much more quickly, um, but they'll remind the person one last time. Let's summarize what we talked about today, Mr. Smith, and they will go through each of the, of the things that they agreed upon in just a word or two. And then they'll finish by saying, and you agreed after they did the benefits section and you agreed that we can meet those needs and i always tell people when you come to the end of the benefits say, section ask them how it sounds to them if they seem enthusiastic when you do your summary you don't need to reiterate how you're going to meet their needs if they don't seem that excited when you say you agree you let's review what we talked about you said you needed such and such and such and such and agreed that we can meet those needs with this, 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 and this. If they seem more interested, they, when you say, how does that sound to you? If you've done it right, honestly, most cases they'll say it sounds good. Then you can just say, let's, let's summarize what we talked about today, Mr. Smith. You said you needed this, 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 and this, and agreed that what we have to offer meets those needs. Um, and of course, you wanna be watching how they respond to that because you're gonna to go to your very next step, which is, um, setting action steps. You want to close the conversation. This is another thing. People will go and they don't really have a goal for how to end the conversation. Go knowing what your, what your goal is at the end. It may just be an appointment to do a survey of something at their operation, or it may be able to, to be, you may be able to absolutely close an order if it's <clears throat> what you're trying to do. So close the conversation by setting clear expectations and next steps. Include what you will do. Here's an example. In order for us, for you to take advantage of what we agreed upon, I will prepare a firm proposal. Include what you need them to do. To be able to do that, I will need you to provide me quantities you need and your delivery expectations. You need to set dates and times for continued contact. I'm going to send you the proposal by tomorrow afternoon and we'll be back in touch with you on Monday. Um, I, or, or I will deliver the firm proposal to you via email by Thursday afternoon promise to do it. I promise to follow up with you next Monday morning by telephone to see what you think and see how we can begin meeting the meeting meeting the needs you have. Why do you promise? Because when you call them back, you are fulfilling a promise and you say, when we spoke last week, I promised to call you back this morning. You are not going to annoy, annoy them if you are fulfilling a promise. That's why promise to do something and when you call back, remind them that you promised to do it. And at the end, of course, you wanna thank them. So that's obviously in a very, very brief way, some stuff about doing consultative selling. Um, oh, I keep going the wrong way. Portraiture of success. My wife, basically of 35 years now, I met in a sales training session that I was putting on. She was both the cutest and the smartest person in the room. Um, so I felt I had to marry her. No. Um, anyway, it is how I met her. She told me that the thing she liked most about the sales training was portraiture of success. 
Now, let me give you a, an example of not portraiture of success. I don't know if some of you have seen the movie. It has been around for a long time, but it's a classic. It featured Roy Scheider, and the movie was all that jazz. And Roy Scheider plays the part of the real life person not living anymore, Bob Fosse, who was a dancer, a director, um, and a choreographer. He was also a drunk and, and a drug user. And he comes to the mirror, he's ready to go on stage. He's a mess. He's drunk, he's stoned, he doesn't feel good. And he looks at himself in the mirror and he says, it's showtime. Well, that is the opposite of what I'd like to suggest. Um, I like people to visualize, to create a portraiture of success. Visualize how a successful sales presentation will go. And that is, I'm going to go in, I'm going to do this on a sales call. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do a nice quick introduction. I'm going to get permission to probe. I'm going to use an open probe to get some general information. Then I'm going to use closed probes and find out what they need. I'm going to summarize what they need. I'm going to present my benefits. I'm going to, I'm going to summarize one more time and set action steps and close the order. That's visualization of a successful sales call. And if you do that, um, before you go in, that will often help you do a really, really good job. Um, after a presentation, you can, you can do the same thing. Think about how you went through the thing, what you might have done better. You could visualize how you might have done that by applying positive visualization um, to what you do. You know, in this world, there are people who, if you, if you ever go to Hong Kong and you're the first person into a shop, they believe in luck. And if they can't make a sale on the first person who comes into their store, the whole day is gonna be a waste. So they will do anything to keep you from walking out of that shop without buying something. And it's called first sale, first sale, first sale. They'll say it, first sale. Um, a lot of people who are in sales are superstitious, especially telephone people. If the first call goes badly, they start looking for coffee and talking to their friends and walking around and stuff like that. So I like to have people try to visualize how it's going to go. If it doesn't go so well the first time or whatever, visualize how it could have gone better. And that way you'll be able to keep yourself really focused and, and doing your job. If you know your stuff and that's how you, that's how you will be success. That's how, show time, that's how it's showtime works. If you really know your stuff, and you've visualized how you're going to go through your presentation and you do it and you never miss a beat. I had a guy who worked for me who was not handsome. He was not, um, he was not aggressive. He was not persistent. He ran South America for me. This guy was selling sometimes 10 times more of the same stuff that domestic people were selling because he went through the process of finding out what people need and meeting those needs. And he never, never, never skipped a step. And he was incredible. And like I say, he wasn't a big, handsome guy. He was slapping people on the back or anything like that. He was just a very plain sort of a guy. But he followed the process, followed the process, followed the process every single time. I would go out in the field with him. And I would be just amazed at how he just would follow that process. And he was just, he was incredible. Okay, wrap up. Time to, perfect. Um, remember to know, know your subject. Know your audience. Try to keep things simple and short. Use attractive graphics. Practice your presentation with anybody you need to and can and who's willing. I do a lot, by the way, with the people I do with sales training. They call me up and practice the presentation on me, which is fine. And use portraiture of success to make yourself uh, be successful. Thanks for attending. Uh, Fred, are you coming in or are the rest of you coming in? I, I'm here, and Aaron, with your and Justine's permission, uh, I'll do a little shameless advertising. But first, Larry, every time I go to this presentation, I learn something, and it never fails. In addition to the knowledge you impart, you always entertain us. You kept the audience at bay. You got everybody's attention. So we're blessed to have you. Thank you for Thank all of you. Thanks. I wish we had uh, 50 more Larrys as part of our team. We do have 50 mentors as SCORE. Um, we're a nonprofit arm of the SBA. We're here to help you. Anything we can do, it's free and um, it's a service. So if you need some help as a, from our, one of our mentors, it's SCORE.org and register, uh, register um, for whatever your needs would be, whether it's a new business startup or an existing business. And at that, 
I'll thank you all again. And Aaron, Justine, is there anything else you need to add? Uh, thank you, Fred and Larry. Thank you very much. That was that hour flew by. So, uh, and uh, so many things to learn. So, thank you very much. Will this pres We know that this will be recorded and sent out to all of those who who um, registered. Will there also be a copy of the slides for people? Sure. Okay. Thank you very very much for that. Um, I know that I, I I will use it over and over again. <laughs> It's what, um, but also we have just want to very quickly talk about our next two workshops as uh, we have the, in two weeks, we have Anna Para. Anna, do you want to say something very quickly? Sorry about that. I was trying to eat my lunch and I was, did not want you all <laughs> to have to see that. So um, fitting everything in. So yeah, thank you, Erin. You actually summed it up so great at the beginning of the presentation, but I know some folks were not around for that one. Uh, but we are, we have invited some uh, panelists uh, and clients of the Women's Business Center who really um, are understand and are very, um, I call it self-aware, but self-aware about their business um, and do a great job communicating uh, what they do, almost have, have that mission for their business uh, nailed down. So we will be hearing from them um, on October 7th, um, and that's this, a Thursday as well from 12 to 1. So I, I look forward to that. So thanks, Erin. Great, Anna, thank you. And um, this truly was a lot to learn. <laughs> Um, we, the next, the next workshop in our series will be on October 21st, and that will be hard conversations around problems. And how do you discuss problems with partners, your employees, your spouses, your investors? And we will have a panel to discuss that as well. These workshops are all on at noon as on these Thursdays. Uh, Justine is going to put a link in the chat so that you can register for the next two. These workshops, plus many, many others are listed on the startgrowupstate.com website. That website on the events page lists many different events and workshops to, that were, are available to support you as you start and grow your business here in the upstate. Uh, we have many organizations beyond our SBA partners that provide workshops and training. So please visit the startgrowupstate.com website. And thank you for staying just a little bit extra today. Larry, thank you very much. You bet. Um, we do have one last, for anybody who wants to stay just a little bit longer, uh, Earl is around and he will talk to you very quickly about the programming that is available at Clemson through the, the Small Business Development Center. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to update everybody really quick that uh, that Clemson has a program that uh, incorporates the grad level students, and uh, we've had a lot of success with that uh, regarding uh, getting some market research done, competitive analysis, uh, positioning within the marketplace, any kind of uh, data uh, driven decisions that you might need to make. Uh, this this team is available through our offices here in the upstate. So if you want to reach out to the small business development centers in Clemson, Greenwood, here in Greenville or Spartanburg, we have access to this uh, student team group and they'll be happy to help you with a lot of the preparation that you heard is so, so valuable when you're walking up in front of a client these days. So uh, take a look. Let us know if we can help. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to everybody. And I'll just give a little, um, oh, yeah. I'm just sorry. Add that it's it, it's a it's a great program. We have uh, we've worked with the SBDC folks um, with some of our clients, our Women's Business Center clients, and they've just been thrilled with the results. So I'm just adding a little plug for that. Good. And Anna, since we it looks like we have a few women entrepreneurs on the, on the on the call today, would you explain what y'all do? Sure. Um, we So I am with the Community Works Women's Business Center. Um, we are a part of Community Works, but also a SBA resource partner. Um, and we provide uh, support and uh, empowerment services to uh, women business entrepreneurs, but also um, 
anyone <laughs> and do that by um, through either one on one coaching or uh, through our different trainings and webinars um, and educational services. So we are here to kind of we start with a consultation. So if you want to sign up for a consultation, I'll put uh, the Community Works uh, website on our on the chat. But that's communityworkscarolina.org. And if you go to the Women's Business Center, you can re register for initial consultation to see if um, there's a way that we can provide that assistance to you. Great, Anna, thank you. Thank you. And all of the programs from SCORE, upcoming workshops uh, from SCORE and from the Women's Business Center and SBDC are on the events calendar at uh, startgrowupstate.com. Larry, thank you again. Fred, thank you for organizing. Earl, it's always wonderful to partner with you. Justine, thank you for making sure we were organized <laughs> today. And y'all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. You bet. Yes. Um, and, um, would Fred, would you um, or Larry, would one of you like to email me the, the slides and I can include that in our recap? Fred, can you do that? Uh-oh, we lost him. Fred's He's gone. Oh, yes. Right, there you go. Lose one me. of us will do it. I was cheating. I was copying the uh, links out on a piece of paper so I could have them for future reference. But to answer your question, yes. Um, if right. I get email addresses, I can send them out directly if that's something you can send me. As, All right. As, if you organize the meeting, you have the uh, I do. Wendy's email address. Yes. Uh, and I should be on somebody's email. So uh, if you send them off to me, I can do that in the next five minutes. Great. Thank you so much. Good. Okay. Fred, yes. Yes. Um, when... Um, yeah, on the same email where when uh, with that Larry's on too. Larry, your process is yes. um is it is it on one of the slides? And I'm really embarrassed to ask. <laughs> I was well, paying attention, no, <laughs> but is the process? It's on a bunch of them. <laughs> it's not yet. You know what? If I get your email address, I will send you the sales. I'll send you the whole sales training. Uh, set of slides that we use. Fred, if if you give Fred your email address, we'll I'll we'll I'll send you the whole program. It's a program that Xerox developed in the early 1960s that was so successful that IBM came to them and said, "Can we send our people to your training?" And Xerox realized they had another business and they started a division called Xerox Learning Systems that taught people how to do. It. It's called need satisfaction selling, and it works. It works for anything. A waiter who wants to sell a dessert or someone who's selling multi-million dollar investments. The method works, works, works. Like well, I, I was in college in the in the early 80s and we we in a, I, was, I was a communication major and so we did sales and this I mean this I I so the I'm not going to say this very well. So that Xerox program was held up as the gold standard. Yeah, and I, so thank called, you. It was originally called, um, what was it called? PP, professional, PSS, professional selling skills. They had professional selling skills one, and it was professional selling skills two. Then they had an, a, a thing that came off of it about negotiating, but it all worked. It all was part of the same same. And I actually learned it because I was traveling all over the world. I did it in Japan. I did it in Rio. I did it in Paris. I did it, you know, in <laughs> Israel. I did it everywhere. So it really became uh, it became a thing for me, and and that's what I do. I, that's I'm not a mentor. I'm I'm what they call a subject matter expert, and I put on the workshops. But then I co-mentor. If any of our mentors have a client that needs a sales pitch, I will do a two-hour intensive meeting with them and help them put together a sales pitch. Very glad to know that. Good. Yep. Yeah. I'll. Uh, I'll. If Fred, get your email. I'll. I'll send him the the slides for the whole sales training program. All right. Wonderful. Well, cool. thanks everybody. And Justine, thanks for staying on a little bit longer. Yep. Thank no you. Problem. Have a great right. afternoon. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.